This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, tonight, we have no public comments, and so we will move directly into the uh, board and administrative reports. We'll start, as always, with Superintendent Johnson's report. Superintendent Johnson. Good evening, Chair Nordine, Commissioners, and Executive Team members. Over the past two weeks, we've had increasingly substantial time and energy dedicated into our themes of the reopening of schools. Beginning Tuesday, August 4th, I reached out to Steve Weld and provided some helpful feedback and clarification on the questions. On the 3rd, about masks and face coverings too, I included in preparation for the next day's meeting with principals and we'll take any other feedback this evening to principals this coming Wednesday. We learned of many questions and concerns about the drafts of schedules presented Monday night, August 3rd from principals as staff had reached out to them during and after the meeting. Mark Goings and I scheduled a meeting for Wednesday at noon to discuss what he had known and learned from staff. Tuesday afternoon at the executive team meeting, we set an agenda to take principals to an exercise with the draft schedules that were proposed. Wednesday had begun with all principals and some directors at 8 a.m. at North Star. The workshop item was a World Cafe format activity. We had a great deal of feedback, questions, concerns, and opportunities on the new schedules <clears throat> and instructional model for students. Kim Kohler will address this activity that we share with principals and the ECAE Executive Board in more detail, as may Jim Schmidt. Finish my evening with a Zoom meeting with the Hmong PTA about a reopening of the school's plan and received questions and assistance on how to communicate and connect most effectively given these difficult times. I was honored to be invited to that meeting and truly enjoyed my time with over 35 individuals. It's very evident we must continue to review and revise our communication methods to make them culturally responsive to the students and families they serve so that we can all work together to meet the needs of all of our learners. We were able to look at the survey data immediately on Thursday morning, August 6th. <clears throat> Three people should be commended for their fine work. Michelle Radkeen assessment, she shared data immediately after midnight on Thursday for us, and Kay Marks and Hannah Jones from HR. Kay and Hannah provided a draft to the exec team for the entire elementary staffing model after working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Thursday, August 6th. I was very impressed by the work ethic, problem solving skill, and attention to detail. On Friday and through the weekend, our exec team was communicating about the data from the family survey and impact on each school level, as well as preparing for the August 10th to 12th work with principals, as their time was and is so valuable in preparing for school at this time. Last week's work meant more of the same dedicated time to the reopening of schools. We had opened a significant piece of time for our principals to collaborate as a K-12 group, but also in level groups to assist each other with all the questions and concerns from the following week on the instructional model, safety, scheduling, and other logistics. Our principals were able to meet from 8 to 2 from Monday through Wednesday to accomplish some significant tasks. Throughout this week and last, I continued my one-to-one -one meetings as part of my 100-day plan and 100 stakeholders. I'm now entering the phase of some of our teacher leaders, and it's been very productive to meet with them. Most times, I'm able to share questions or concerns with our administrative members <clears throat> so that they may be addressed. This past Wednesday, Terry Piper Thompson had filmed welcome videos where I'd welcome new staff for this week. And Dr. Nordine joined me later to film the all staff welcome for the week of August 24th. That afternoon, I was part of a state superintendent's virtual update with select members of DPI presenting and answering questions from us. There were many questions on health orders, educator licensing, and instructional hours. Thursday morning, we were invited to the CVTC ECASD Business Management Orientation and Signing Ceremony that was so effective and successful. It was a great pleasure for district staff and me to represent the district in this established partnership with CVTC in welcoming 39 Northland Memorial students into the second cohort of business management students who have the unique opportunity to graduate in 2024 with both their high school diploma and an associate degree in business management from CBTC. Strong partnership involves dedicated students, families, and teachers at both the K-12 and college level. It's so impressive that we're able to save families money, provide high quality education, 
and remove barriers for all our students to access opportunities like this. These innovative opportunities are so welcome to meet the needs of all our students, and we really appreciate the partnership with CDTC. After an equity ad advocacy team meeting on Thursday and other connections and important work on staffing and scheduling, we were also part of an Eau Claire City County Health Department update for all county school staff to address questions and concerns through reopening schools. There were approximately 475 participants in the meeting. We continue to be apprised and are aware of not only the virus trend in our community, but also throughout the state and nation with schools opening. We must be ready to change course quickly if necessary. And we're well aware of how critical and focused our staff development will be next week with all staff. Friday was extremely important. I was part of a newscast early in the morning on TV 13 with Lisa Gabizi to share information from our district and county relative to athletics and the impact and communication flow in our district. After a brief meeting with Mark Goings in the morning, I then joined district and school administration to listen to the approval process and discussion of the WIAA alternate schedule model via its board of control. After our team's discussion and subsequent Big Rivers Conference AD's meeting, I then connected with county and conference superintendents. We obviously announced our decision on early Saturday evening, and I will share more detail on our reopening of schools, activities, and athletics slide. At this point, I would like to transition back to Chair Nordine for his update. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. So as you mentioned last week, uh, Superintendent Johnson and I did record a welcome back message for staff and families in the district. The first that both of us have done in our roles as superintendent and board president. Uh, and just like everything else this year, it does look a little bit different than welcome back messages from the past, but uh, we just want to note how we're looking forward to the new school year, even under these challenging circumstances, and how grateful we are to the staff for their dedication and their hard work. And I also would like to thank Terry Piper Thompson for filming, directing, and coaxing us through some nervousness to uh, get to a final product that I think uh, is really great. And tonight, you can see from the video that you're watching that we have added as we planned to more to our blended model of board meetings with four of the board members gathering here in person and three virtually to model and practice the environment our staff and students will be experiencing in two weeks. The executive team, as you've already seen, is once again meeting in person in a separate room. And for the foreseeable future, this is the mode that we will choose for our board meetings. Uh, board members and administrative staff will be able to choose the option that works best for them. We'll now move on to our school board committee reports. We'll start with budget development. Uh, we haven't met yet, but I'm going to be working with uh, Abby and Mike this week to set up uh, uh, times for uh, us to meet, hopefully before the next uh, board meeting. So uh, when we'll be discussing, uh, in particular, uh, the referendum is one of the one of the hot topics we have to get on that agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Harder. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, LEAP and Demo and Trends are still in their summer hiatus. Jim and Kim, if you could let me know if that's correct. Uh, LEAP, LEAP did not meet with one of the LEAP uh, last week with the Arctic Zone to work on this, their essential learning outcomes and um, grading practices. So we did have a interim meeting and then the full committee meets again on the 8th of September. And that's correct for Demo and Trends. Okay. Uh, policy and governance met last Tuesday to continue our work on anti-racist, anti-bias policy to make substantive changes in our district. Uh, this will be the ongoing focus of our policy work. Uh, we reviewed and discussed an equity framework that will be used in policy development, and Superintendent Johnson shared several different groups in administration, staff, and other stakeholders who will use this tool to help identify policy areas in which we can address anti-racist equity building across several parts of our district function. To that end, we reviewed policy 343.1, the old version of which we repealed a few months ago. Uh, that one will be replaced by new language tied to our equitable multi-level system of supports. And we had vigorous discussion around strengthening the language in it for anti-bias and anti-racism. We also discussed uh, monitoring and data collection needs for that policy. And so because while policy is our starting point, we must and we know that we must ensure anti-racist practice in our policy uh, in action. We also reviewed and recommended policy 443.7, the Code of Classroom Conduct, for review later tonight by the full board. 
And we began initial work in building a set of coherent governance policies for our board. I have compiled and shared with board members the complete coherent governance policies, all 156 pages of them, uh, for several different districts across our state and nation. Our next steps will be to look at draft versions of some of the coherent governance policies that show less variation uh, between districts, such as the requirement for the superintendent to make sure that the district is properly insured. Some of these things that are more cookie cutter from district to district and less. Uh, the idea is that we can take care of some of the simpler policies in development while developing a framework and setting up full board work sessions in order to discuss the more forward and tailored policies found primarily in results and operational expectations. Uh, on my first pass, and there are many areas where the board will be able to focus on setting a strong vision for district performance and to codify our commitment to anti-racism and anti-bias in Eau Claire. And of course, all of these policies will be reviewed by the full board, and I intend to have working documents available for all board members to view at their convenience. And I would invite my colleagues who are not currently serving on PNG to share feedback with us uh, for this effort as we move forward. Policy and Governance will next meet on September 17th at our new regular meeting time, Thursdays following board meetings uh, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. We'll now move on to the legislative update, Dr. Johnson. Yes, uh, political gridlock at the federal level has prevented progress on providing additional federal aid to schools, states, and local governments and small businesses. Um, and the recent executive orders are mostly unrelated to K-12 public, uh, public education. The U.S. Department of Education's new Title IX regulations take effect today. Uh, the new rules direct how schools respond to sexual harassment and sexual violence. Every school district must have new policies and procedures in place paired with required staff training to ensure compliance with the change regulations. Some key provisions include the definition of sexual uh, harassment, uh, requirements for schools to offer clear, accessible options for any person to report sexual harassment, uh, protect K-12 students by requiring elementary and secondary schools to respond promptly when any school employee has notice of sexual harassment, and then shield survivors from having to come face to face with the accused during a hearing and from answering questions posed personally by the accused. Uh, the interesting piece, the new Title IX regulations are not without controversy, uh, make, as some of you may be aware. The new regulations can be examined further utilizing a special report by uh, the Brookings Institute, which kind of took a nonpartisan approach to the examination of Title IX. Uh, State Department of Revenue uh, errors may result in higher than expected property taxes for school districts. The issue uh, could have been resolved if state legislators passed legislation to correct those errors. However, uh, our uh, state session is, we're not in session at this particular time. The issue centers around errors that occurred in determining how much exempt personal property existed in each taxing jur jurisdiction in the state beginning in 2019. So some school districts uh, paid more uh, property or were given more property aid. Other school districts were not. Uh, and now they're coming to collect the balance. So hopefully Eau Claire was uh, uh, received less, hopefully. Uh, to date, uh, the governor has announced initiatives involving allocation of $1.76 billion of the $2 billion uh, in the CARES Act funds. Uh, uh, that remain unspent. And then what do I have? Oh, we have school health services interim COVID-19 infection control mitigation toolkit sponsored by Wisconsin DPI is available on uh, on their site. Uh, pretty informative uh, for uh, I think parents, uh, teachers and staff of schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Our next item in the agenda is the consent agenda. The board considers the consent resolution agenda items and votes on them with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any items, please speak up and it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and voted on separately. Tonight's items include 7.2 minutes of August 3rd, 2020, minutes of closed session, August 3rd, 2020, 2019, 2020 budget adjustments, Gifts in the amount of $172,556.90 for the period of July 1st, 2020 through July 31st, 2020. 
payment in the of all bills in the amount of six million nine hundred thirty three thousand eight hundred sixteen dollars sixteen cents and net payroll in the amount of three million two hundred forty six thousand three hundred six dollars thirty seven cents for the period of July 1st, 2020 through July 31st, 2020, human resources employment report and mask requirement additional modifications. Uh, I will accept a, a motion to approve the agenda, consent agenda. So move. Second. Move Dr. Johnson, second by Commissioner Harder. Let's take a roll call vote. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Commissioner Harder? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Nordine? Yes. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved. We have no individually considered resolutions tonight, so we will adjourn to committee. We have uh, two smaller items and one on our uh, requested reopening of schools update. We'll start with the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation annual report. We'll turn that over to, I believe, Sarah French. All right, let's see. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? You can. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, let me pull up my slides here and then we will share content. That's what I want to do, right? Yes. Thank you, Marissa. Okay. Okay, perfect. Event reporting in progress. Very good. So you guys can hopefully see these slides. Yes. We can. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, then I'll go ahead and get started. So, um, hi, I'm Sarah French. I'm the executive director for the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation. Um, thank you for having me tonight. We are excited to have the opportunity tonight to share with you several updates from the foundation. Uh, this is actually a great practice to get into, and we'd love to present for you again in the springs as well when our annual reports come out. So, let's see, we'll go to our next slide here. Um, so as your charitable partner, we serve as the private support and fundraising department, so to speak, of the district. As you know, tax dollars support the ongoing operations of our schools. And as the state and federal allocations for K-12 education have declined, the importance for private support to supplement has become critical to ensuring that our kids today have the same access and opportunities that millennials, Gen Xers, and boomers also had growing up. So what exactly does your foundation do for you? Um, simply put, we raise money to support whatever the district's needs and priorities are. And um, what does that look like specifically? We were established in 2011. In our first nine years, we've raised over $3.6 million to support the district in funding that might not have otherwise existed. Um, what else? Of that 3.6 million, we've granted over 743,000. And actually, as of today, that number is over 776,000. Um, and that number is before the cost of the Solar on Eau Claire Schools project, um, which will be another 290,000 in cash grants to support the district. So, of that 776,000 granted dollars, um, what do those granted monies support? What does that look like? Uh, we have a greatest needs fund and wish list for each of the 20 schools in the district. Um, we have an annual teacher grant cycle where teachers write in requesting funding for projects. We administer the annual Golden Apple Awards. We manage several scholarships that support ECASD seniors and graduates. And of course, we facilitate the fundraising for special projects like the Solar on Eau Claire Schools Project. The greatest needs and wish lists change from year to year, of course. Um, those sorts of things are fluid um, as needs change. Some examples of greatest needs that principals have identified from year to year have been um, replacing musical instruments in their band and orchestra programs, um, sponsoring after school programs like Longfellow's um, JRLC program with the puddle jump, 
and supporting technology needs, which of course has become a huge need um, in the past year. Um, we offer a grant cycle each fall where ECASD teachers and staff can write in requesting funding to support innovative and immersive experiences for their students. Some of the many grants we've issued in the process have been to support field trips. Um, for example, two years ago, we funded a field trip for the French classes at Memorial and North to go see a play at the Guthrie together that was performed entirely in French. Um, we've also made grants to our schools to bring in visiting authors and musicians and artists. Um, and then of course, we've funded flexible seating to support our students who are more kinesthetic learners um, and more. Um, as you know, we also administer the annual Golden Apple Awards. Um, these are the annual awards celebrated in the spring that honor one staff member from each of the 20 schools, as well as one district wide staff member. Um, these folks are nominated by their staff peers and they each receive unrestricted grant funding to use to benefit students. Um, each January, WEAU's Bob Gallagher and I, along with another um, foundation board member, we go into the schools with the news crew and the, like the cameras and everything to surprise the honoree with the special news. Um, and over the years, the principals have gotten super creative with those surprises, um, even sometimes bringing everyone in the school, all the students, all the staff, um, to surprise, it, bringing them in for the, for the surprise as seen by this photo here um, at Longfellow this past year to surprise their golden apple, who was their playground supervisor, Denise Hainan. Um, hopefully you've seen that news coverage each winter. It's a really um, warm and fuzzy reminder of why we all do what we do, um, our awesome students and staff. Um, we also manage several scholarship funds that are annually awarded to Memorial and North grads. The scholarships support a variety of different areas um, and, and support a bunch of different priorities for our donors. Um, some of those include music and arts, the sciences, athletics, as well as community service. Um, we're especially proud of the J. Murphy STEM scholarship, which is a $10,000 a year renewable scholarship, and that's available only to ECASD seniors. Um, often scholarships of that magnitude are competitive at the state and even federal level, um, but this one's available only to ECASD students, so that's pretty special. And then, of course, we are thrilled to facilitate the fundraising for special projects on behalf of the district. Um, the most recent project is the Solar on Eau Claire Schools Initiative, which, as you know, is installing solar arrays on North and Memorial High Schools to incorporate into the STEM curriculum at the high schools. Um, with the value of the donated panels, the cost of installation and maintenance, and the annual utility cost savings, it becomes a more than $900,000 value add for our district. And then, of course, we compile all of this information every year into our annual reports. And those are um, documents that we give not only to our donors, but we also mail those to all ECASD staff, including you commissioners. So that's kind of a 10,000 foot view of the foundation, what we do on behalf of the district. Um, we're really proud to fundraise on your behalf and support the district in the ways that are most meaningful for you. So just kind of wanted to give you guys a brief overview of who we are and what we do um, and hope we can get into this practice more. But at, I mean, at this time, does anyone have any questions? Well, Sarah, I'll start by thank you for sharing the work of the foundation with us again it is uh, very warming in a time where we've been focusing on so many difficult decisions and so much uh, hard work to just have a little chance to sit back for me and say look at all the good that we're able to do in partnership with the foundation so yeah thank you for bringing that forward i cannot personally wait until i get to see those solar panels up on our schools i know we're very very close we're very uh, close yes yeah. I will, uh, of course, open the floor to my colleagues for any comments or questions for you. Mr. Lyons. Uh, how close are you to, uh, what's the update on the solar panels? On the solar project, yes, we issued a press release. I wanna say last week, we are less than $34,000 away. We are almost there, we're at the finish line. 
So anyone listening in tonight, now's a great time to donate. If you haven't donated yet, now's a good time. We are almost there. Um, we're so excited to see this come to life for our students. So Sarah, I will say that I've already donated and uh, I would encourage everybody who has already donated to also look back and see if you wanna just kick in a little bit more. And so yes. I'll put my money where I'm mouthed out. I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll see another donation from me as well. I, 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 this is one of the best projects I think I've, I've had the opportunity to be a part of even in this small way. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Yes, if you've already, many commissioners have already made a gift to the, to the fund. Um, and what's exciting about this fund especially is that, yes, we've received um, big contributions from Pablo Foundation, and that's amazing. Um, but the vast majority of the donors to this project have been our neighbors, our individuals, friends, um, school board members, city council members, um, teachers, students, even ECASD students are donating to this project. It's really exciting. So it's very grassroots and it really kind of shows what a community can do when we come together. All right, anything else? Any other questions? If not, all right. Well, thanks for having me, you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the work that you do on behalf of our students, our staff, our schools. Um, and we just, we love working with you and you just keep telling us what your needs are and we'll keep going out and asking for money. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks guys. So we'll now move on to our reopening of schools update as requested. So I'll turn the floor over to Superintendent Johnson and the executive team for that. I think, oh, there we go. I'm going to pull up a presentation. Marissa's giving me like superpowers here to share with me. There we All right. go. Thank you. Well, good evening. As we had agreed on July 20th, here's our second presentation noting our progress and update on the reopening of schools. This evening, I'd like to start by updating you on Friday's WIA determination and approval in our district plan for athletics going forward. Before I begin, this is a very difficult situation in the decision-making process for all involved. I've had the privilege of being an athlete, a teacher, a coach of many sports, and a parent of athletes who participate in WIA sports. I know how important athletics are, as do the school and district administration, who are the decision-makers in this process. This weighs heavily on all of us, as we know the impact it has on our students, family, and the community, from both aspects of physical health and mental health. On Friday morning, the WIAA Board of Control approved several details of a one-year alternative season in the spring for fall sports and reduced the numbers of weeks for sports during the 2020-2021 winter and spring seasons at its August meeting. The Board of Control established the parameters and context for the alternate fall season with seven weeks of competition in spring. School and district administration collaborated during and immediately afterward to discuss the impact of the approval an alternative season on our district and its students and coaches. Later that afternoon, the Big Rivers Conference activities directors met and had done the same. We informed, we informed parents Friday evening that there was not a decision yet as conference activities directors were speaking with our superintendents. On Saturday, conference superintendents were able to connect regarding this issue. Each district has board for administration to provide their decision or recommendation. Saturday night, we did announce that we had decided to postpone the fall 2020 sports season as currently scheduled. Our district will adopt the WIAA proposal to move fall 2020 sports to spring 2021 according to its approved alternative model. No seasons will be eliminated, winter, fall, or spring, and the WIAA is approved and adopted model to make room for another season. Instead, this will be a shift of seasons within a truncated model for all sports. The schedule will be winter, fall, and then spring, ensuring that the spring season ends in late June. It will have been very difficult to compete in certain sports in the fall due to the impact of our current Eau Claire City County health orders and social distancing requirements, regardless of the risk status of the sport. And we will follow those rules and orders. We wanted to ensure we had the most recent and up-to-date trends and information from Eau Claire City County Health, as well as give the best chance to our programs and families to prepare and compete if there were a change in the order. 
We also realize the impact of another conference in county schools. While other schools may choose to participate in lower risk sports this fall, the numbers of students we serve in those sports, as well as our instructional model, is different for us. Our instructional model also impacts our decision because we would place our students at a competitive disadvantage that students would have due to the educational model, the AADB schedule. We will not be mixing cohorts of students. That being said, the possibility of one day of practice and possibly one game each week during a six week season gives our students fewer opportunities within our lower risk sports. This is not equitable for our athletes in competition with other big river schools or false far smaller schools in the area under different county guidelines and orders. Other larger schools like Wausau, La Crosse, Green Bay, Appleton, and Madison area schools likely take with them in this model. If other big river conference schools were to choose our schedule, regardless of sport, we would love to continue participating with them. However, each school has a different county to guide them, as well as different recommendations or orders. Ultimately, our AD's immediate work is to ensure a successful spring after rescheduling from this fall. There is an immense amount of work that goes into this. The district will look to provide any opportunities that are available based on WIAA guidance for fall sports, ensuring they're reflective of our learning model and public health guidance. We will also implement the following additional extracurricular provisions in support of the safe reopening of our school and community. Virtual general training activities or in-person general training could be shared for all students. For example, stretching, flexibility, warm-up routines, speed and strength training, conditioning, and mental preparation, sports psych psychology resources could be offered as long as they adhere to standard WIAA coaching contact rules. We hope to return to education-based athletic programs with additional guidance from the WIAA and Eau Claire City County Health, which will allow us for the best opportunity to prepare for a safe return if our to our facilities available. Once again, we will provide our students with best practices and mental health support, along with virtual training opportunities and connections to help facilitate when we're ready to return to in-person athletics. At this time, I'd like to transition to Kim Kohler. Thank you. The health and safety of our students and staff is a priority as we return to school. As you're aware, physical distancing and masks are part of our plan to mitigate the spread of the virus in schools. Tonight, you defined access, acceptable face coverings in our district. As you know, we've received masks for each student and we'll be distributing them to students. An important part of what we do as educators is to teach students, including how to wear a mask. We begin each school year teaching expectations, how to walk in the hall, what level of voice we should use in the classroom versus the cafeteria versus outside. This year, we will also be teaching students expectations about masks. The task force has been developing resources for teachers to use to help them do this. And I'd like to share one of them with you tonight. So Marissa is going to take control of um, the screen and she's going to share a video. We can't share it um, to everybody simultaneously, but it should pop up on your um, screen and I will give you time um, to click and watch that video. Oh. So, Kim, I think for those of us in the in-person room, what I'm going to have to do is mute. I have to do a little fiddling with our camera so that we can see the video uh, with volume on. So you'll forgive me a moment as I juggle a few things. Sure, I think James is making his way there. He comes. There he is. I am not able to view. I'm sorry. I'm not able to view the video. It's, it appears, but it does not allow me to play it. Any tips? Yeah, the same issue. Oh. I, I'm getting the same problem. You're getting the same. So what I can do instead is I will share this video with you, perhaps in board docs um, at a later time, and then we can view it that way. And we can just move on um, from this instead. I need I think that's probably for the best, Kim, just for the, to make it easy to continue on with the presentation. So, Marissa, I think I need control back again then.
And I'm now the presenter. There we go. Um, okay. So you should see the PowerPoint again. Is that true? Yep. Perfect. Um, one of the other questions that um, folks have asked about related to health and safety are HVAC requirements. So the, I want to share a little bit about that. The district is committed to following the orders of the Eau Claire City County Health, including physical distancing, wearing masks, and frequent hand washing. The order does not include guidance for HVAC or MERV ratings, but I do want to follow up, Dr. Johnson, on your questions about our systems and the MERV ratings on our filters. Um, as you're aware, a MERV rating tells you how effectively a filter traps small particles. The higher the MERV rating, um, the higher the amount of particles that the filter traps. Currently, we're using a two inch and four inch um, pleated or bag type filters, and the MERV ratings range from eight to 13, depending on the age and design specifications of the equipment that's in place in our buildings. We rely um, on our filter vendor and engineers when determining the best filter options for equipment that we operate in our buildings to provide um, maximum efficiency. Utilizing filters that exceed the specifications for any equipment may result in decreased airflow due to more resistance in the system, um, which results in that decreased circulation or ventilation of air being supplied to spaces. So that's why you see on the right-hand side of your screen that kind of relationship between the filter and air circulation. Um, if the, um, there is decreased ventilation being supplied to spaces throughout the building, um, that creates a potential for indoor air quality issues to develop. So by making sure we're within the design specification um, of our HVAC experts, this helps us to supply the best ventilation possible for the occupants um, in that room. In regard to your questions about HEPA air purifiers, we are currently not utilizing any of those devices within the district at this time. At the last um, board meeting, I shared these checklists with you as well. These are the daily and deep cleaning checklists that will be used by all buildings and ground staff at all of our facilities. Additionally, each room will be supplied with a spray bottle with Oxiver TV spray and paper towels so that surfaces can be wiped down between cohorts or groups of students. As a reminder, Oxiver TV is known to kill COVID as well as other viruses. And so that, I, I want to invite um, Director Giese from the Eau Claire City County Health Department to share her thoughts about the health and safety measures that we've put into place um, in the district or any additional thoughts she may have about our health and safety plans. I believe um, Marissa has unmuted Director Giese. So if you uh, would like to add your thoughts, Director Giese, we'd appreciate you doing so at this time. Thank you, Ms. Kohler. I appreciate the time. I do want to let the board know that the Eau Claire City County Health Department has been working closely with Eau Claire Area School District leadership and staff. Uh, regular meetings are happening and we um, are really intending that the measures that are being taken following the order, but really following best practice are about mitigating the risk as much as possible in this virus. We have kids that want to be at school, as you know, and various strategies that can be taken, particularly the six feet distance that Eau Claire School District is really spending time on making sure happens. Um, to slow the risk down of spread. So our perspective at this point is that those strategies that are in place will help slow the risk, um, to help slow the spread and decrease risk. There will be um, regular monitoring of symptoms and oh, the health department is actively planning on working through the start of the school year on making sure that we are staying on top of things. So I think we all know that this is a learning process for everyone and um, the strategies, particularly the distance related strategies and the mask strategies will make a difference. Thank you. 
Um, and with this, we'd like to turn it over to Jim Schmidt to talk about some of the work that his sections have been doing on the task force. Thanks, Kim. At your last meeting, we discussed the equity audit tool for the district's reopening of schools task force division teams. We shared the tool and the seven sections it has. And so we have, um, and, and how teams are using that tool to ensure that they're finding considered all of our students, especially um, those that are traditionally marginalized. We've adapted this tool for buildings to use with their reopening teams. And we want principals to review the tool and how to use it to create an inclusive reopening environment. The tool is not being used as a checkoff or something just to simply turn in like a document that say done. Um, it's being used for teams in their conversations about students in their building and to reflect the work that they have already completed. This continues in play, this continues to place the lens of equity in front of all of our work. So now I'd like to transition to Kate Marks to discuss the instructional model survey summary and how that has driven our staffing process. Thanks, Jim. As you know, the district had families communicate their interest in participating in either the blended or 100% virtual instructional model for school year. Over the response rate, overall response rate for the survey was 85%, which far exceeds the industry standard for survey responses, um, which is usually less than about 20%. You can see the illustrate, you can see illustrated here that the total number of survey responses for each of the instructional models broken down by level. Overall, based upon the responses, approximately 81 to 84% of families elected the blended model <clears throat> K-12. And similarly, approximately 17 to 19% of our families K-12 were interested in participating in the 100% virtual model. The district also has more detailed information broken down by specific buildings, and that information will be shared out with the community on the district's frequently asked questions document. With the information provided to the district through the family survey, the revised staffing process began. Determining FTE need for each instructional model by level. Size is required to meet. With, with much smaller class sizes required to meet social distancing requirements, the staffing model has changed significantly for the model. The process also includes the reassignment of staff to 100% virtual programs. When determining how staff will be selected for these assignments, the district considers the following. ADA accommodations for medically documented concerns, CARES Act requirements, Requests from employees which failed to meet the specific requirements for uh, the criteria needed for either ADA or the CARES Act. And then finally, volunteers. Procedurally, the district also looks to repurpose positions to meet district-wide needs. And finally, the hire of limited-term staff should that be necessary. As you can imagine, the staffing process is extremely fluid, especially at this time of the year, under these circumstances and with these tight timelines. The information on the slide before you indicates a quick overview of where the district is at regarding the varying stages of completion for each of the steps of the staffing process. Determining the needed FTE for each model, as you can see, is nearly finished at the elementary level, is about halfway complete at the middle school level, and due to the complexity of the unique options provided to students, the high school process is still in the Reassignment of virtual staff is in the beginning steps. This work lends itself not only to the previous work completed, but also to the medical needs and accommodation of district staff. Repurposing of positions is nearly halfway complete. Only the potential to hire limited term staff is right where it should be. It's teed up with the background work already done so that the district is ready to take action when and if the time comes. With that, I'll transition this back to Jim for additional information regarding the new instructional models in the district. Thanks. To develop the blended and 100% virtual models, in this diagram, you can see the level of detail that has gone into planning. So this shows six different grade levels from kindergarten to grade five. And I'd like to just note a few items. Uh, we will not bring you through each box, don't worry. 
Um, each day starts with social a focus on social emotional learning. As a matter of fact, last week our social emotional learning committee committee continued the work from the social emotional team from the reopening of schools task force um, to continue to push the, that learning into the explicitly into our classroom instruction. The second piece is that art and library media are pushed into the classroom. Um, and finally, music and physical education are facilitated virtually. However, physical education teachers will be at school and at, el at the elementary level, we are counting on them to support movement in the classroom and to take students outside for movement breaks when they are able. Our next slide shows um, a draft of what the virtual model will look like. At the elementary level, there's a focus on synchronous instruction two days a week Mondays and Thursdays with a heavier focus on the district's learning management system, Seesaw in grades K through two, and Canvas in grades three through five, the other days for asynchronous learning opportunities for students, in addition to virtual check-ins from, from staff. At the middle school level, the document here is actually split. There's actually one large table that I just cut in half because I couldn't, it didn't go vertically far enough. So it kind of wraps around and each part of the table has four columns. The first two columns uh, example of what we would see in sixth grade. The first two columns show in-person schedule and the last two columns show the virtual schedule. The middle school principal has been working to have the encore instructors, those outside of our core areas of English, math, science, and social studies, who instruct virtually to come into the classroom during what they're referring to as mini classes. You see those on the right hand side of the um, set of table, tables. So they continue to create connections with students. In addition, those same teachers, those encore teachers, will support the virtual component of the blended and 100% virtual students. Finally, at the high school, they work to create cohorts between their upper level um, age students and their low, lower level age students. <clears throat> so grades nine and 10 students. As you can see in this example, we'll eat, so they're on the left side, and then the grade 11, 12 is on the right, and you see that they eat at different times. Additionally, four of the five periods are for core instruction, and then it's supplemented by a fifth period of electives. The in-person electives are being finalized. Uh, they're still working on those today, um, with the rest of the electives being provided online. And finally, this is an example of <clears throat> the virtual instruction, 100% virtual instruction, um, we have, they've actually split their virtual cohorts into two groups. And then on the left side, you can see um, group A receiving um, periods one, two, three, and four, two days a week. And then periods five, six, and seven, um, other two days a week, and then reverse for the other set of students. And the instructions available um, um, at these times and the content may be provided live um, or asynchronously through Canvas and Microsoft Teams. Finally, on the instructional model, um, this is an almost a draft. And the reason for the, the red um, draft is for the fact that they are constantly being revised right now. Um, at all levels, they are redesigning a model to work in during a pandemic, something that they've never had to do before. We're nearly done. And I like to refer to the work being done now as they're sort of in the sanding phase versus cutting, chopping, and drilling. And through this process, we've worked with principals, the Eau Claire Association of Educators and their executive team, school teams, curricular teams, and others for feedback. We focused on five main domains, class size, instruction, duty time, prep time, and flex time for instructors. Just a reminder that flex time is that 45 minutes each day that's part of the eight hour day which teachers can use flexibly. So just to bring you through the process a bit, um, a week ago Wednesday, we worked with all principals and directors using a protocol, a workshop protocol called the Road Cafe. And that activity provided a great deal of feedback, questions, concerns, and opportunities and on the new draft schedules and the instructional model for all students. That afternoon, same afternoon, the executive team, at the executive team, we arranged the questions, concerns, and opportunities from the morning's principal activity and prepared for the Teachers Association to join us the next morning. And that next morning was an extremely productive time with the Teachers Association team. We explained the activity, shared alterations that have been made since meeting with the principals, and as a result of the previous morning's activity and any suggestions that we received. We told the association that they would go through the same activity and would have the same opportunities that the principals had 
We had 12 teachers participate with a variety of experiences and level, and we were very, and they were, uh, we were all very impressed with how different their questions were from the principals. And we were all very extremely grateful for that opportunity to participate together. We discussed themes and communicated the flow for future use on these on scheduling instructional model. We plan to bring them through another round later this week um, when we really try to tighten the schedule down. So we're not done yet. Uh, we continue to do that refining um, and we have, um, we'll have more answers to share with them as we continue to work with, with different groups. But it's been a very, very much has been an iterative process that hasn't been dominated by one particular group. So before we take other questions, I know that Lisa will be with us for um, just a few more minutes. And so um, I'd like for you first to be able to take, have an opportunity to ask questions of her um, before we lose the opportunity to connect with her for the remainder of the evening and other questions you have regarding the reopening. Thank you, Jim. I wanna just thank all of you for your hard work, uh, both in designing alongside all, all of our staff, our principals, our teachers, and the administrators and the central office here. Thank you for all that hard work. Uh, I'm particularly thankful for the responsiveness that you've shown to both questions from the board, but also questions from the community. We heard a lot over the last two weeks. What will the virtual option look like? What will the virtual option look like? And tonight you've, you've provided that information. So thank you for stepping up and being ready to bring some of that forward. I know everyone is getting, you know, we're getting very close now and uh, I'm thankful to, to that. Uh, so as we open it up, uh, I have, uh, well, again, first questions for Director Giese, and then once we've exhausted those, we can move on to other questions. So, uh, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have uh, two questions as it relates from a Oklahoma, a Oklahoma County Health Department perspective. Could uh, we get, could I get clarification on the uh, the, the definition of, of an outbreak, uh, is it, it, would it be by, uh, in our case, would it be by, by school, would it be by classroom? And then I'm also curious as to the same, uh, would there be similar notifications uh, provided publicly as we've seen as it relates to some of the contact tracing pieces of where uh, potential uh, COVID exposure has existed in the uh, in the community. So those are my uh, my two questions. Thank you for those questions, Dr. Johnson. And I will first let you know that the team has been working closely with all the school districts, and we are close to having a resource available to the to the schools across our county that walks through in detail some of the questions that you brought forward. One of the things we've been waiting for is outbreak guidance from DPI and the state health department. And that is imminent, we hear, but has not yet been shared with us. We are wanting to make sure that we are in alignment with what uh, the state health department is saying related to outbreaks and potential um, closure of classrooms or schools related to significant outbreaks. So that is guidance that yet received, we're waiting for that. In, in any circumstance, school, business, or other setting, two or more cases is the definition of an outbreak, most simply. So when we have two or more associated cases, that is considered the start of an outbreak that are connected because of a workplace or a common location. We, like any disease in a school system, would be working with the school if we had a case of COVID-19 in a school um, with the school themselves, but also obviously with the district to walk through uh, not only what happens with an individual that is COVID positive, but also what happens to their close contacts. We have a process with working with any employer, in this case, the school district, to identify, to help us identify close contacts if they were in that environment, and to then contact all of those close contacts so that they stay home for the quarantine period. The quarantine period is 14 days since the point of last exposure, and it is a six foot distance for 15 minutes or more. So, Every circumstance is very specific. In most cases, it would be exposure, for example, in an elementary school classroom within that classroom likely, 
Um, and in some cases, it may be more depending on what the interaction has been. It's part of why we're working carefully with schools to decrease the group interaction between different parts of a school system to keep staff and faculty and student sized groups as small as possible. So, well, I know your question, you know, deals with that whole concept. It is very situation specific. It is typically at the smallest level possible that we would look at the exposure and potential contacts, but then it's really based on the very careful interviewing of that contact and the, in this case, the school leadership to determine what the potential close contacts would have been. Seeing no additional questions right now, I will say thank you, Director Easy, for being here tonight and sharing your time. Thank you for the work that your department has been doing throughout the entirety of this event. We are lucky to have such professional and uh, competent, oh, sorry, uh, so professional and competent leadership at the City County Health Department. Uh, I see, Commissioner Zura, you have a question. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess to piggyback off what Commissioner Johnson asked, so in the event that there is an outbreak at one location, you aren't anticipating that, would we then close school, would the whole district close? And I guess um, we can talk about this in a little while, how those kids would transition, um, you know, within our system, uh, within the the instructional model. But so, so it's kind of how you're seeing closures going, whether they're classroom closures, uh, you know, it's like one classroom is pulled out or a cohort is pulled out or would a whole school close in the event of a two or more um, connected cases, uh, whether those cases were within a classroom or within a building. Um, the other thing, the other question I had was related to staff. Um, so if a staff person were to contract COVID-19, um, would all of the staff students then be considered uh, close contact since that person's likely to be in closer contact, especially at the elementary level um, with those students or how would we deal with uh, with staff members um, testing positive? And the last question was movement within secondary schools. It does not look like students are staying and Jim, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong that the students are staying in their classrooms. It appears that they are moving within the building. Um, and what type of challenges does that create specifically uh, to some of these protocols that are in place? Sure. I can answer the first part about the movement in the building. They actually are putting the, uh, the students into teams and having them housed in a section of the building and moving instructors, rotating instructors to the students as much as possible. Yeah, and I can follow up with some of the health related pieces of The team at Eau Claire School District have been working really hard to pay attention to the principles to decrease spread. And that really is what our order has been about and what our um, what the challenge that we all have is, is that the six foot distance is our primary prevention strategy. We want kids and we want really everybody in the community to be doing things as much as possible. Um, but, but also paying in attention to the fact that that six feet distance will help us decrease spread. So in related to the first question, if there is a child or a staff person that is COVID positive, the goal always is that if everything has happened in a way that is maintaining six, six feet distance and maintaining that ability to um, keep spread to a minimum, there may be very few to no people that have to stay home. Um, the closure of a classroom or a cohort group is really the extreme way that we would have to deal with um, exposure. So we have had examples in, for example, daycare classrooms where um, an individual teacher may go to multiple classrooms or be in close contact. And that's a different exposure than 
where there is a distance maintained or a very small group maintained. Our goal is if distance can't be maintained, but in most K through 12 classrooms, it can be that um, the only people that potentially are closely exposed are those in a family contact situation. So again, the school district is district is working hard. We need to have families and um, staff and parents and teachers all being on the same page that our best strategy is six feet distance. So we remember to do it. And then um, and then the elimination of people because of a COVID positive staff person or student will be minimal. Uh, so again, your question about the classroom, it, there's no simple answer to that. It's all about how many people came in closer contact than six feet. So in certain circumstances, um, we know that there may be closer contact and there may be then exposure to, for that one person to be or two people that were in close contact to have to stay home and be quarantined. The same with the teacher. Um, it is not by, um, it wouldn't be an expectation that in most classrooms, a COVID positive teacher, um, if they were in that classroom, would result in the whole classroom having to be quarantined. Again, our expectation of the school is that they're working hard to make sure that that distance is maintained. Um, I think the last question already was primarily addressed, but there's nothing that um, in the order or really in the principles of this disease that should result in kids not being able to move safely and with space out to go be outside and have classroom time outside or have movement time outside. Uh, again, the goal is to keep distance and to keep the cohort group as small as possible. I think I've got everybody on my screen now so that I can see for people calling for the floor. Director Easy, again, thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate the insight and the teamwork that the department has shown and the willingness to work with us uh, to keep our community safe. Thank you. At this time, I'll open it up to any questions uh, from my colleagues or comments. Right, Commissioner Lyons. I just wanted to thank uh, Director Schmidt for more information on the virtual option. Um, I'm interested in <clears throat> the cohort A and the cohort B, and um, if parents, how that process is going to work. So when will parents understand which cohort their children are in, and is there um, any effort that's being um, given to try to deal with families and their schedules? So the cohorts were finalized over the weekend, um, and that is being communicated to families this week. Um, it was, uh, they went through, the primary driver of cohorts was um, based on street address um, to ensure that um, we had balance in terms of the students so that if we were to, so socioeconomically, um, racially, um, special education, all those other um, variables within, uh, that we have in the, in the um, buildings. Um, by using street addresses, our primary filter um, really helped um, uh, drive the cohort development. But then there was a lot of going through and ensuring that families were kept together because sometimes we have split families. Um, we had to look at some unique, if you remember the um, situation of some of our EL students and our special education students, um, they have, are there for four days. So we had to do some, a lot of hand scheduling to try to coordinate that those lists as well. But, um, but that is being communicated out to families now this week. Great. Dr. Johnson. Uh, I, uh, my, my first question is pertaining to the uh, uh, the secret uh, synchronous system, the learning management system, and what happens when uh, uh, the system becomes uh, overloaded. So to give you an example, uh, once the university, uh, once we went to completely remote, we rely on Canvas as well as our remote system, but. So did a lot of other uh, institutions, not only within the system, but outside of the system. And there were issues in terms of uh, 
uh, being able to log in when there's multiple people trying to log in at uh, at time. So I'm I'm curious as to what are our, our uh, um, some of our uh, uh, technical ways of getting around, or are we going to have a balance in terms of that? Uh, the amount of students who will be reliant on synchronous and asynchronous, and does that also align with the 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 availability of uh, you know the the Wi-Fi concerns and all that? So was was that uh, taken into consideration? So the um, the first question, actually, I'm going to ask you a question in return. Were you the situation you observed? Was it a lot? It was a, a lot of a, a lot of synchronous. Um, learning that you were that you were running into issues like that or no? Yes, it was. And so individuals trying to log in for a synchronous situation at the, uh, at the same time. So uh, uh, some uh, some individuals uh, in, in, in that particular example, uh, some individuals on, on campus uh, decided to hold their face-to-face uh, -face, uh, class times at the same time uh, remotely. And so you had these uh, uh, numerous uh, groups of students logging in, attempting to log in at the same time to do uh, synchronous, synchronous learning, which uh, the system itself, you know, it's interesting, learning management systems, uh, they work well, but the intention is that not all users are supposed to be using them at the same time. And, and, and that's really uh, uh, an interesting piece, given I'm pretty sure we're not the only school district that will be relying on uh, a learning management system. So that's kind of where my my, my, my questions are, are, are coming from. All right, so our experience both, um, there's a couple of things. One is the learning management system. The other is actually a platform like this, like WebEx or Microsoft Teams. Um, we have not had uh, experienced those issues um, and um, significant issues. Um, we continue to scale and do more and more, and we haven't really hit a threshold yet. And our tech team has not indicated any concern in terms of our contracting service level agreements um, or the stress test, even on our system when it's done internally. Um, and so, and, I, and I'm looking over at my tech director who's nodding as well. So we feel pretty confident um, that we have that in place. And when we're within the district, um, we do have a pretty good pipe uh, to the internet from, from the district. They've done a lot of good job on the infrastructure things that no one sees um, to really make sure that um, when students are within our environment that, that we can control, we have a lot of confidence on connections. Now, can't always control um, individuals when they're at their homes and how good their connectivity is and whether Netflix being streamed up and down the, the city street is affecting their, their connectivity, but, but we've had a lot of success in turn. Dr. Bika? Not, not no? Okay. Commissioner Clements? So a follow-up or a question for Commissioner Johnson. So we have our, our virtual um, charter school, uh, which has been online um, for a couple of years. We've had some questions about you know, why can't we scale that up or should we scale that up or what would it mean to do that for, for those students who, who are looking for that um, environment right now um, without any bias about whether we should or shouldn't, uh, what would be the, the option or implication of exploring that further? So we actually um, brought a teacher team together to investigate that same question. And actually, when we looked at the um, uh, when we looked at the um, going 100% virtual, we asked the team to consider because there's different things. There's there's the teachers, and then there's the content itself. Um, the virtual school for the grade six through 12 purchases virtual content from Pearson and Pearson instructors both. Um, we have the option to purchase just the content and use our teachers. Um, and when we talked with our with our own staff about it, they felt very strongly about using Eau Claire Area School District content as opposed to Pearson content for our 100% virtual students. Um, mostly because we knew that students are that there's the, we're going to have the opportunity for students to transition back and forth. Um, but also, eventually, students will transition. I mean, this is all hopefully going to come to an end. The assumption is that we will. There will be a, a day of normalcy and to shift. So to move students to a large number of students to a um, Pearson curriculum away from district Eau Claire Area School District curriculum and then back to Eau Claire Area School District 
would create um, con continuity issues of learning for students. Um, and our teachers overwhelmingly told us that they felt that they could collaborate both the, um, the virtual teachers and the ones doing the um, blended, that they could um, collaborate collectively to support the content. It's, it's not developing new content, but making it accessible in the online um, environment. And they felt that they could successfully do that and, and were overwhelmingly um, supportive of using district content at that level. When we came to you back in June, we really were talking about expanding Pearson content and Pearson instructor. Um, so the uh, Eau Claire Virtual School is really that design is a very separate entity, which is which students are walking into without an expectation to, to um, be able to rapidly transition back to the Eau Claire Area School District content. And so um, and so with such a large number of students, number of students um, going with 100% virtual that we have now, to be able to shift them to entirely different content um, and curriculum um, back and forth um, is not something that, that would be endorsed either by the Eau Claire Virtual Board um, or our teacher groups that we refer to. We do have Dr. Johnson in the queue again, but I want to ask uh, Commissioners Harder or Zur if you have any questions sort of in this first round, uh, just to have an opportunity for everyone to speak before we cycle back. Commissioner Zur? Yeah, so I was still forming my thoughts, but I'm ready um, partially. Uh, so I guess the, the I, I'm hoping to get an update on busing. I know that you guys are just now figuring out cohorts, um, but I think parents um, and folks listening would would love to know what that is sort of shaping up to look like if you have. That information that would be great. Um, and I guess I keep coming back to staffing. Um, and I have a few questions here. Um, and, and excuse me, they're a little scattered right now. So one of the things that I've heard a lot about, particularly at the secondary level, is prep time. And I know that you guys said that you would you would address that with some of this World Cafe models, bouncing it off certain um, constituent you know groups at the secondary level. But I'm wondering if you could just say more about what, because those those all those schedules, elementary all the way up, those are stacked schedules, and and teachers are with kids just all day with very little break, especially lunches in classrooms. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering if you guys could talk about how that's shaping up the different grade levels, but particularly at the secondary level, because um, I think it's an an extra challenge when you have to teach, you know, an intro course and an advanced course, um, it, you know, per, perhaps right back to back um, with little time. And then also how virtual check-ins are gonna go at the elementary level. Where do those fit in that big schedule that you just showed us of elementary? Where, where are these teachers going to be checking in with their cohort outside um, of the classroom and how will that how will that work? Because my concern is I'm just not seeing a lot of time. I mean, Wednesdays obviously are loaded with time, but where during the normal day are we seeing time for teachers? Um, yeah, so if we could start with, with that, I think that'd be great. I can start. Um, I will um, talk about the busing question and then I can start to talk about, I can speak to the prep question. And then I will pass it on to Jim to talk about virtual check-ins. Is that okay? Um, and I'm hearing that you um, that perhaps we're not speaking loudly enough. So if you can't hear me, if you can let me know that you need to, I need to speak up. I will try to do that. Um, so as far as busing, um, Jim Fine, Student Transit, we're really waiting on uh, the cohort information to determine um, what routes they need to run and what times students would be picked up and that sort of thing. So they now have the cohort information and are working on establishing routes for each school and pick up times and that sort of thing. Um, Jim Fai is confident that if students um, indicated that they would need uh, transportation this year through the survey, if they qualified and needed it, He's committed to um, making that happen. So we know that um, the by using the address, um, the home address for the cohort, that automatically then decreases the number of students that um, would need a ride on any given day um, because we're taking approximately 50% of the students in any neighborhood on one day. So 
that um, in and of itself will allow um, student transit greater flexibility and um, allowing them to meet the requirements that the county um, is asking them to meet. They have also worked very closely with Eau Claire City County Health to um, take a peek at buses and bus safety and um, the requirements for health and safety. And I know that they have a, a good plan to address those needs as well um, while students are on the bus. Um, in relation to prep, I'll speak to prep at every level, actually, even though you, you asked specifically about secondary schools. Um, one of the things that we talked with the association about was um, what prep time looks like this year, because if, if you look at a schedule through a student's view, um, and that is what we've shared um, in all of the board meetings, is what would a student day look like? Um, sometimes it's hard to imagine what that, how that translates into a, a staff day. So what we did was we spent some time with the association talking about this is what prep time would look like at each level. So as an example, at the elementary level, principals are committed um, to allowing elementary teachers get to school approximately 40 minutes before students each day. Um, and previously, that really was um, taken up quite a bit, and I'm an elementary principal, right? We scheduled that time almost every morning, um, either with a staff meeting, a PBIS meeting, um, parent meetings. We are committed um, as elementary principals to leave that time for teachers um, to be able to prep. So rather than using that um, for um, some of the meetings that we need to have, we're really looking at restructuring and um, holding as many um, of those meetings as possible um, at different times um, during the week so that teachers can have that time every day to prep. Additionally, uh, principals have worked on finding a 45 minute block of time for teachers every morning during the student day um, in order to have prep time at the elementary level. And that will come through art instruction, through library media instruction, and through finding some um, coverage for their classroom in other ways. At middle school, um, Jim showed a schedule that um, had kind of the short classes in the middle of the day. So if you're a middle school teacher, it's very likely that you will have lunch and on either side of lunch, um, actually on both sides of lunch, you will have kind of this skinny section of this day, this shortened class where the allied teachers will come in for a half an hour or so of face-to-face -face interaction with the kids that they mostly see virtually. So as an example, the Spanish teacher may come in and they now have a half an hour to talk about what kids are seeing in Canvas or what they're going to see when they, they have their virtual days that week. Um, then the kids would go to lunch and then after lunch, um, perhaps the, um, the health teacher comes in and talks to the kids. So those two half an hour sessions or 25 minute sessions where those allied folks will be talking with kids are actually the teacher prep time. So a teacher in the middle of their day will have a 30 minute duty free um, lunch period plus 50 minutes of prep time um, because other students or other teachers will be talking with their kids. And then at high school, um, what we're looking at is um, on paper, a teacher will see five, we have five periods per day, um, and they will see that they're scheduled for five periods, but one of those periods will be a, a, a team taught situation where two teachers will be responsible for that class. Um, and so two days out of the week, um, the high school teacher will have a 77 minute prep time or um, depending on who their teaching partner is, they may choose to split it in half every day of the week, um, but they will, they will have um, prep time within that period. So for some teachers that might be first period, others it might be third or fourth or fifth, um, but every teacher within their schedule will have a, a team teaching situation that will allow them to, to free up some time, um, 77 minutes times two, um, which is um, comparable to what they had in their previous schedule. The other thing to know that within all of the schedules, um, we have um, re-examined duties. So high school teachers or middle school teachers used to have 
one period where they would have a duty um, where they would supervise perhaps um, if the phi ed teachers were teaching in the pool and they were doing a swim unit, I might as a social studies teacher be the second person on deck for that lesson. We've reformatted all of those duties and um, provided coverage in all of the in other ways for all of those duties so that classroom teachers do not have that responsibility this year, which we believe will free up other time as well. And Jim, um, guidance around the virtual check in. Yep. And so um, the, we talked to the, uh, when I talked about those five different domains of time that were um, part of our conversation, one is that flexible time where there are 45 minutes um, each day. So two days a week um, on the, either the Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday, um, the staff will post during, um, and they have flexibility with that of how they choose to do it. They'll post a time where they will have, allow for virtual contact time with their students for two days a week. Um, and then, of course, Wednesday, they have two hours built into the schedule. So Wednesday you have, uh, in the morning, there's two hours of collaboration, two hours of professional development. Um, after lunch, there's one hour for any um, either building or district meetings, um, an hour for individual prep, um, and finally, two hours for virtual contact time with students. Um, so over the course of the week, they'll have those two hours for virtual contact time and then two 45-minute sessions elsewhere. And just to swing back also um, with Kim, a little bit more about the prep time. A um, couple of different things that um, what our staff are experiencing too is they're getting significant more time on Wednesday, um, which is really what our early learning teachers had experienced. Um, quite often, they, they did most of their prep was on one day of the week. Um, there's some, they're seeing something uh, quite similar to that because of the situation we're in. And also, um, the secondary has struggled a little bit with um, as something that has been embraced by the elementary, and that's individual versus collaborative uh, time. And at the elementary level, those are seen as the same. Um, they're both prep time, whether individually or uh, collaboratively. Um, and so the time um, at the secondary, um, the time is there. We actually did bring the team through calculations and minutes to show that when you look at the time as a whole, um, they actually do, there actually is an increase in time. And really, it's also recognizing that given the situation we're in the amount of um, different ways we have to try to deliver content, it's going to be very difficult for things to be done by individuals. They'll have to be done by teams. And so um, the prep time looks different, but we are also in a different situation. The work is, is uh, different as well. Thank you. Let's uh, circle back to Dr. Johnson. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and just ask my, my questions. Uh, so we, we have in, in the models in terms of the staffing update that, uh, that's been provided. I'm, I'm just curious as to uh, what's the impact, and maybe I missed this from the multiple presentations, but what's the impact moving forward as it pertains to our, uh, our pre-K early childhood programs and the community partners that we, uh, uh, that we work with? That's my first question. Uh, the second question would be, uh, could someone address how are we going to, especially for our students with uh, 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 disabilities who have extensive uh, related services and direct services um, on their IEPs that don't fall within the high frequency attendance uh, uh, of schools, how are we going to address those needs? And I, I, I would hope that the response would include something more than just a, a rewriting of IEP goals and objectives. And then my, my, my last question is on the, on the uh, slide, it says this, this reassignment of, of staff. One, uh, hopefully, I, I would hope that our, our, our district and building leaders have uh, articulated and communicated with those reassigned staff, their particular roles, but what the impact does it have on FTE uh, and or, uh, uh, as I've been hearing, uh, on uh, contracts for uh, uh, this upcoming year? And that last question, I have to uh, add the full disclosure. I'm, I'm married to a teacher in the particular district who has not uh, 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 received the contract, so that's a disclosure on that third one. So thank you. On the pre-K partners, um, so the early learning model is shifting from um, three and a half days a week for four days a week. So typically they had been um, once a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for three and a half hours. Um, the model that we approved back on July 20th moves that to two days a week for 
seven hours. So you're either Monday, Tuesday, or your Thursday, Friday. There is no virtual component because that actually meets all the instructional minutes. Um, I do know it's been a challenge for our partners um, to meet the um, requirements um, that, have, that have been laid out by Eau Claire City County Health. Um, so they're in a very similar boat that we are trying to um, take their existing resources to try to balance that. And I know it's been a they, they voice their concern. There's been a lot of conversations, but, but we're, we're experiencing the same thing that they are. Um, in terms of the IEPs, um, the goal is to actually develop service plans like we did in the spring. So we do not rewrite IEPs. Um, basically say, well, if we're not able to accomplish something, we have to rewrite the IEP and something that we can accomplish. Really what they do is they do a service plan for each of our students and that is a really big call. Um, and that's what they're um, working on now. And they did that back in the spring. So we have nearly 2000 IEPs that we need to um, determine the service plan. So to be able to deliver the services that students are required through the IEPs. Um, and I'll let Kate talk about the staffing. Sure. So in regard to uh, communicating with staff members who uh, will be repurposed, since the decisions haven't been finalized, um, and if you would go back to that chart that, you know, um, in terms of the uh, stages of completion, um, we're not we're not complete with that yet, but obviously when we get to that point, yes, um, people will be uh, communicated with regarding um, any anybody who's been repurposed to a different area um, or a different responsibility for this next year. There was a lot of talk, um, even when we had our World Cafe work with the association um, about uh, you know, rumors that have been going around from staff, you know, being worried that there are, you know, 15 year veterans, you know, a health teacher and being um, afraid that they'd be repurposed to a first grade uh, classroom teacher. And we had ample conversation numerous times about any type of repurposing that would happen in the district would be, um, Although there may be modifications made by the DPI, um, we're anticipating modifications may come from the DPI about um, this year there being some leeway in terms of licensing um, that we certainly would look to keep people into areas for repurposing that are as close to what they currently do or have done in the recent past as possible. Um, so that wasn't something that we were looking to do. Um, any type of repurposing would be very similar to what um, their current role is or role that they have done in the in the recent uh, in the recent past. Uh, the piece, uh, Dr. Johnson, about contracts. Um, uh, all certified staff received in the spring their intent to renew letter um, because the uh, uh, association bargain with the district hadn't been finalized yet to be able to provide people a contract that had their updated salary on that. Uh, we anticipate that those contracts will be coming out um, before the end of summer. Um, usually uh, when this sort of thing happens, um, it sometimes it would have been actually right um, into the beginning of the school year, but um, we're hoping for yet um, prior to uh, student arrival. Um, a lot of that still has to do with the timing of things related to just the backlog of work as a, as a relation to everything happening with COVID-19. But otherwise, um, everybody who's currently working has, in essence, you know, a contract through their intent for a new letter. Um, it's just that it hasn't gone through the system with an updated actual contract with their updated salary on it. So if I, if I could, just to follow up there, so would that... With that uh, 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 re, uh, reassignment uh, 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 of, of those staff who will be uh, be needed elsewhere, it's the it's the expectations though that those reassigned staff will uh, 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 will work uh, according to their to their FTE and whatever those reassignments are. Is that that's the is that is that the expectation or is that yet to be determined or does the building leaders uh, determine that based on based on needs and based on where uh, uh, there are uh, still staffing concerns available. Yes, so it'll right. There won't be any reduction of FTE for certified staff. Their their letter of intent to renew that happened in the spring was for their full um, FTE uh, that they had had last year. There was a handful of people that had a very small reduction in time or in FTE at that point in time. 
So whatever their intent for a new letter indicated at that point in time is their FTE moving forward into the school year. Um, so, but based on anything that's happening in terms of the repurposing or restructuring of our new instructional models, there won't be any reduction of FTE for certified staff based upon that. So um, what they had at the end of last year for their intent for a new letter is the same FTE that they can expect to have going into the school year. Um, all of their contracts indicate that they're um, a certified teacher in the district and that they would be placed somewhere within their licensure. So um, contracts wouldn't indicate that you're a, a, you know, a sixth grade math teacher at North Star Middle School. So there isn't, the, the contracts aren't specific to that point. It just simply indicates that you're a certified teacher in the district and that your placement um, would be within your, the area of your licensure. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons. Following up on the staffing uh, question, are you at all uh, a bit concerned about potentially running into a situation where we have a staff shortage? And um, if so, uh, are and I I know that's all scenario planning, but um, do you have some kind of ideas on how we might move forward uh, if we if we do get a a substantial amount of our faculty that uh, that do um, become sick or are are um, not able to teach. Yeah, we, we do have some plans in place for that. Um, uh, many of our virtual teachers who will wind up teaching the 100% virtual program who are teaching that program, but not teaching it due to an ADA accommodation where they can't be physically in the building um, in front of students staff, um, but are in the virtual program because either they they're choosing to, or um, uh, it's a, a repurposed thing, but it's not a medical related um, component. Those individuals will, although they're teaching 100% virtually, they're in the 100% virtual program, they'll still be housed within the building um, because it provides another, another body in the building to be able to fill in in the event that we're short on subs or somebody needs to go home at the last moment and there aren't enough subs available. So it provides another uh, piece of flexibility within the building um, to fill in on a moment's notice. Um, the district's also looking to hire permanent subs through Edge of Staff, our, our sub vendor, so that we have some consistent substitutes in the district that would be um, very similar to having a, you know, a similar um, person in the building, kind of similar to our student cohort, so that it isn't a revolving door of people in and out of buildings on a regular basis, but establishing you know, consistent people in um, in some of our buildings so that there's that um, consistency with with um, the adults that are in and out of buildings. Um, and then we've also talked about the fact that, you know, many of us are certified to teach and uh, be in classrooms and um, we talk about contingency plans and, and how we will cover things. Um, you know, all of us have been in classrooms and so plus multiple other people who work at the district office as well. And so um, we do have those contingency plans for in the event that there aren't enough people to cover in buildings um, that we feel we feel confident that we'll be able to make that happen. Thank you, Kate. Before I move on to Commissioner Zur, I'll just note that we do have uh, up until about 850 budgeted for discussion on this item. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, Commissioner Zur. Thanks. Um, so I guess the the last thing I've I've really been curious about. So it's it's been really incredible to to listen to the amount of work that everyone has done. And I just want to take an opportunity to commend this district for the tremendous. I, I just can't. And and I want you to uh, everyone in the rooms there to know that every person I talk to, even if they are upset and they're distressed and they're angry. They're so, so grateful for the work that's being done. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, and as I guess this question kind of comes to, okay, we actually can lift this off the ground. Um, what happens when we need to communicate with families? So I wonder if you can speak, I'm sure you guys have talked about this. Um, what is the time frame gonna be like for communication in the event of a closure or in the event of, uh, I mean, obviously you, I know the county health department is going to be involved in this. They've talked about it. We've seen the documents. 
but how how are we planning to help families transition to virtual if that is going to be what our students are going to do if if their classroom is closed or the school is closed or the district is closed and then how do you foresee us reopening how do you re, like foresee reentry for these families is it going to be just start where we were again um, or are we going to be looking at kind of having to rethink something or redo something or re cohort or so I'm, I'm kind of curious of, of what that communication is going to look like and how fluid are these transitions going to be, if that makes sense. Sure. You need to take that or start with it or? I guess I could start very generally. Um, while we realize that the way instruction was delivered and what we had done in districts across uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, basically everywhere, especially even if you did have a learning management system like Canvas or a Schoology, it was dependent upon the state on uh, how prepared you were, how much time the, the state had allowed you to prepare uh, for distance learning. And I think uh, from what I had learned here in Eau Claire is that uh, people sought that input from the district level to families and families just said, you know, we understand that uh, you had to kind of stop on a dime and turn and pivot. Um, and it was very, very difficult. Um, but we, we've learned and I think we've adjusted professional development as well as technology where we're not going to be able to do that anymore to have that uh, that luxury of that much time. I think we're going to have to be awfully nimble and awfully fluid. And I think that's going to be something that um, that's going to come up with our not just our new teachers and staff this week, but with all staff next week. So I'll hand it over to Kim for some more specifics if you like. Sure, and I can just share some of the things that we have done to be intentional, knowing that transitions could be um, in the future either way, either for everybody to go virtually or for everybody to come back face to face. So um, Jim had mentioned earlier that um, if you are in Eau Claire virtual school, there's different curriculum um, than there is in face-to-face -face school. And the things that we have committed to and done intentionally was to have all of our virtual instructors, those in the 100% virtual model, um, collaborate with and partner with those in the blended or face-to-face -face model so that um, when we transition one way or the other, from a child's standpoint, the learning targets will be seamless. Um, they will have had similar experiences and similar learning outcomes up to that point. Um, additionally, as we um, developed the schedules for children and for staff, we intentionally created schedules that would allow for a more seamless transition um, between or among models. So when you look, for example, at the secondary level, um, you will see that um, the, the um, courses are grouped or um, are scheduled in a way that will keep pacing online to those who are face-to-face -face, um, in comparison to the virtual model. Um, and same thing at the elementary level, that pacing and, um, and what happens within the schedule was very intentionally designed so that we could be fluid between um, the models. And then the third thing um, that we really were intentional about in designing the um, model from the very beginning was we wanted some consistency and predictability for families. So that is um, why you see um, in the overall model that we said whether we're in phase A through E, we would have this blended experience for students. So that even though the health department um, updates their orders every two weeks, we did not want to put families in a position of updating their educational model every two weeks. We really wanted this to be um, consistent and um, predictable for families and for students. So those are some of uh, the things that we put in place intentionally, not only to be able to transition, um, but to be able to provide predictability for our families. And one, one thing also I'd like to add, and Dr. Johnson, I think I misspoke when I was answering your question about special education students, because we've gone from service plans um, last spring, and then 
we do have to rewrite our uh, IEPs this year to match our instructional delivery model. And everything Kim was talking about, we have to do in that design process um, to, to, you know, to support our students in that as well. So um, we know that we may have an interruption to what that delivery model looks like, both for our general education and special education students. And so that's part of the work that is, uh, that, that's going on right now. Um, Commissioner Zerg, just to piggyback on what, um, what has been said so far about what we've been intentional about, we've also done the same thing with staffing. Um, and you may have seen a document that, that might have been shared with the board related to our support staff, our hourly positions, and all of the principals getting together and determining what the expectations for those positions were um, in the event uh, that we needed to switch to a virtual model. Um, whether it was at a building level or um, or the whole district um, or a classroom, however it may be determined. But the specific reason for that was it, it really had to do um, more so with SEL components and making sure that we had built things in to be able to support students in the event of a transition from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual and then perhaps back again from virtual to face-to-face. -to -face. So if... Um, there was purposeful scheduling of support staff to a grade level or a department or a classroom or a group of classrooms. And those individuals started to make connections with students. And instead of being one person who supported the entire building for you know, a couple minutes here or there, but they were specifically um, scheduled and structured to be with a specific group of students and they could begin to develop relationships with those students from the beginning, then if we had to transition to a virtual model, the support for those students would continue with that virtual model. So it wouldn't be as um, frightening, especially for some of our, our younger students, um, switching to that virtual model. And those support staff members in the hourly positions could then continue that same support in our virtual model, and those connections aren't lost. And um, the students could still feel that same connection moving forward into a virtual model. And then again, from the virtual model back to the face-to-face -face model. We're very intentional about that and developing expectations across the board at all levels in terms of what our support staff were going to be doing in these new um, instructional models and how it was going to look if we had to transition from one to the other. Thank you. Uh, certainly, we're going to have more questions as we approach you know, two weeks uh, kicking off our school year, and uh, I appreciate that. I, I want to also say thank you to the administrative team for your work on the FAQs. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about that at our last meeting and the desire to have more of that information right there where parents can get to it, and we've really seen a, a many iterations of adding information, uh, and I I've I've heard from people that it is uh, been well used and they're they're glad to find more information and uh, you know that we keep sending you you know items that may fit there so thank you for that work as well um, if there are no additional questions I'm looking around um, then we can probably move on to our next agenda item which is consideration I believe of policy oh maybe I'll just wait until Meta puts the uh, I want to say 343, but it might be 443. 443. See, I, it was 50-50 and I flipped the wrong coin there. Um, so, Code of Classroom Conduct. Uh, before we do our reading, I wonder, Jim, if I could impose on you to just share a little bit, as you did in policy and governance, about the ideas that we have in rewriting this policy to um, Kind of put the onus on to adults in the classroom doing the teaching and the, the managing. You had a, a a good and brief uh, description of that that I think really hit home when we were thinking about this in the P and G meeting. So the thank you, uh, uh, President Ardine. So the original code of classroom conduct um, was written in the '90s, and it was written because the state statute is a requirement for districts to develop um, conditions for students to be removed from class. Um, we've learned a lot since that time, especially with PDIS uh, being the framework for social emotional learning and um, guiding our behavioral systems in our in our in our buildings. And really, that starts with the foundation of instructions creating a safe and supportive learning environment that is welcoming to all students. 
Um, it involves instruction, and Kim did a wonderful job of explaining that earlier about what that looks like at the beginning of the year in, in terms of teaching behaviors and expectations, and then reteaching and intervening, and really putting the on onus on adults to create the conditions for success for students. Understanding that at some point, um, there, there are limits to where we do draw a line, and this policy update does provide that, but it really is only after lots of opportunities for instruction and teaching and reteaching and creating those conditions. And this really fits well within the district's um, equitable multi-level system of support, which is really a combination of both the academic and behavioral expectations and supports for all students. And those continuum of services. Um, and so um, this rewrite really is reflective of that. The district um, strongly believes that uh, DBIS is a tool that is used at all levels of the organization. It's a framework, it's not a program. Um, and, and within that framework, we use different programs and practices um, to basically to create success for our students. And so that's really the, the backdrop of that. And woven within here, you'll see some uh, links to um, state statutes in terms of physical restraints, seclusion, and some other things that really are all part of um, uh, bringing that whole that whole environment together in terms of creating successful um, social emotional learning environment for all students. Thank you, Jim. Um, in terms of a reading, we often try to do sort of a pop, pop excuse me, a popcorn format. Uh, given the way that we are spread out, it is unclear as to in what order we would do that. So what I will ask is for perhaps uh, one. I'll I'll read some, but uh, perhaps one volunteer. I was thinking I would read uh, the first page here uh, and then someone else could pick up on the second page. Do I have a volunteer that would be willing to do that for me? I could help. Commissioner Lyons, thank you. So, uh, you know, when we're fully back in person, we'll probably go paragraph by paragraph, but in this case, this might be more effective. Uh, the Eau Claire Area School District uses the Equitable Multi-Level System of Supports, MLSS, as a framework to guide staff in working with students. Within the MLSS framework, all schools are expected to braid academics and behaviors to improve student outcomes. As such, all schools shall utilize the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, PBIS, framework to create a supportive social and emotional learning environment to ensure access, opportunity, and success for all students. PBIS requires that schools define behavioral expectations for all students in order to maintain a safe and productive learning environment. These expectations should be created with students at the beginning of the school year and be taught, practiced, and reviewed on a regular basis and when data show a need. When students exhibit behaviors that interfere with teaching and learning, they may be temporarily removed from the learning environment. All removals due to code of conduct violations will be documented and communicated with parents, guardians, according to Wisconsin State Statute 118.164. If the removal leads to seclusion of the student, the physical restraint and seclusion form must also be completed. Code of classroom conduct, when a student may be removed from class. The code of classroom conduct is designed to ensure that all staff can teach and all students can learn in a safe, predictable, and positive environment that is equitable and uses an anti-bias approach. The teacher shall follow the continuum of response strategies to provide specific feedback, reteach contextually appropriate behavior, and discourage uh, contextually inappropriate behavior while managing behavioral errors within the classroom as defined within the behavioral framework of the school. Once a teacher has exhausted his or her strategies to manage the student's behavior, the student may be removed from the learning environment following the code of classroom conduct policy. Procedures for student removal from class. The teacher shall send the student to the school principal or his or her designee and notify the school principal of his or her designee immediately for the reasons of the reasons for removal. In addition, the teacher shall provide to the student or his or her designee within 24 hours after the student's removal from the class a written explanation of the reasons for the removal. When a student has been removed from his or her learning environment, the principal designee shall decide where the student remains while out of his or her learning environment. According to Wisconsin State Statute 118.1643A, the school principal or his or her designee shall place the pupil in one of the following. One, an alternative education program as defined in section 115.287 E1. 
Two, another class in the school or appropriate place in the school as determined by the school principal or his her designee. Three, another instructional setting. Four, the class from which the pupil was removed if after weighing the interests of the removed pupil, the other pupils in the class and the teacher, the school principal or his her designee determines that readmission to the class is the best or only alternative. The principal designee will work with the student to determine his or her readiness to return to the classroom to continue learning. Peer support occurs when students provide knowledge, experience, emotional, social, or practical help to one another. Through implementation of the PBIS framework, students and staff have engaged in collaborative practices to create and understand school-wide expectations to foster a positive and respectful learning environment. A student's peers shall provide encouragement and assistance to support his or her successful re-entry back into the classroom following a code of conduct violation. Communication with family. Within 24 hours of the student's removal from the learning environment, the teacher shall notify the family of the student's removal from class. A concise and specific written explanation for the cause of the student's removal will be documented in the school's PBIS student data collection system. A copy will be sent home to the student's family. Considerations for students with Section 504 plans and students with disabilities. Students who have Section 504 plans and students with disabilities may be temporarily removed from their learning environment under the same terms and conditions as non-disabled peers. However, there are federal and state laws that identify specific procedures to follow when a change in placement will need to occur for a student with disabilities. The change in placement cannot be made unilaterally by teachers or administrators. Section 504 and IEP teams must address behavior issues at least annually in developing the student's plan. Discrimination. The district shall not unlawfully discriminate in standards and rules of behavior, including student harassment, or disciplinary action on the basis of sex, race, religion, color, national origin, ancestry, immigration status, creed, pregnancy, marital or parental status, physical, mental, emotional, or learning disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Discrimination complaints shall be processed in accordance with established procedures. Procedures for a student's return. On the rare occasion when a student may be asked to leave his or her learning environment due to a code of, con code of classroom conduct violation, the teacher designee will provide an intervention to teach and practice a replacement behavior to alleviate future removal from class. The interventions must be documented in the district's response to intervention system. ECAD, ECASD staff are universally trained to manage behavior based on the philosophy of providing the best care, welfare, safety, and security for staff and those under their care. Preventative strategies and tools are taught and communicated to students. Physical intervention is to be used only as a last resort when a student presents an imminent danger to self or others. All verbal and physical interventions are designed to be not harmful, not invasive, and to maintain the individual's dignity. Follow-up debriefing strategies will be used to review the situation and look for prevention of future removals of the students and consistency in staff response to students' behavior. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions? Uh, hearing none, we will then include this item on our next consent agenda. At this time, I will open the floor for requests for future agenda items.
When's the, the, the next school board meeting? Or what's our date? September? The next board meeting will be on September 14th. That is off of our regular schedule due to Labor Day. Uh, the following board meeting will be the week immediately after September 21st. So we will have two board meetings, uh, two Mondays in a row, and then back to our normal first and third schedule. I, I if I could, I would request uh, a, a status update on kind of how the uh, uh, first week of school uh, uh, has gone and, and kind of uh, do we, as I, I think some of the executive team members as well as Superintendent Johnson discussed uh, uh, being nimble. Uh, are there things that we need to uh, re re reassess, reevaluate after getting some potential feedback? I'm sure we'll hear from community members, but I, I would uh, encourage our, uh, our, our our staff, teachers, uh, and, and other staff to reach out to us as well uh, for that update if possible. Thank you. Other items for the next agenda? Tim, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for the next meeting, but I just maybe in the future that I'm thinking about it, but I, there's a lot of um, decisions being made and things happening and we have a you know, potential budget situation on our hands that could be, you know, a, a very big deal for us to consider. And I'm wondering, um, at, you know, at whatever point we could get a preliminary update from Abby on sort of i mean i you know what what a, a covid restart is going to look like for us as a district or where we're landing or where we're at whether that happens um in september or if it has to wait until federal money um and state budgets are revamped but as soon as possible would be great sure and if i can tag on to dr johnson's legislative update uh call your representatives at the state and federal level and tell them to get their uh selves in motion uh, to tell us where we stand because, you know, Abby can't give us much of a budget update when we really have no idea what the budget, where the budget stands. We need our, our state and federal representatives to do the work to get us to that point and whether they will stand by the budget as written before COVID or if there will need to be cuts. So that's my uh, shouting at representatives <laughs> for all of you. Please contact your representatives and encourage them to support public schools. Other uh, agenda requests. All right, agenda setting will be 8 a.m. tomorrow, and I would hear a motion to adjourn at 9.01 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? 9.01, we did it. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right, our microphone is still on momentarily. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area School Board. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.